This is the only place in the world where nearly 200 nations meet under just one roof. And it essentially represents the birthplace of international diplomacy as we know it. I'm Michael Weitzner. I've been an architect in New York City for over 35 years. And today, we're going to be doing a walking tour of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. During the height of World War II, the nations of the world, other than the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, sought to establish an organization for diplomacy and peaceful collaboration. In a private meeting with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1941, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt brought up the idea of using the name the United Nations. After the war in 1947, an international team of architects were brought together to design the headquarters of the United Nations in New York City. The end result stands as an international symbol for post-war optimism. And the first major building in New York built in the international style. The campus was completed in 1952, and it was composed of three buildings, one of which is the conference building, which can only really be seen from the East River. But it's the other two buildings that the UN is really defined by, and they stand in seeming contrast to one another. The tall glass secretariat building and the low-slung General Assembly building. So how did the UN end up here in Turtle Bay on the East River? So there were a number of other sites considered. One was on the Palisades in New Jersey, another was outside of San Francisco, and yet another was in Flushing Meadow Park in Queens. But serendipitously, architect Wallace K. Harrison was already working on this site for another development. So Harrison was personally connected to the Rockefellers, and in fact, as a young man, led the design team for Rockefeller Center. And he recommended that the Rockefellers donate eight and a half million dollars to the United Nations to buy this site in Turtle Bay, and that's exactly what they did. And that led to Harrison being selected to lead the international team of architects. That team consisted of 10 architects from around the world, including Oscar Niemeyer from Brazil and the renowned Swiss-born French architect Le Corbusier. And in fact, the overall design and arrangement of these buildings was configured by Le Corbusier, known as Scheme 23A. Over my shoulder, you can see the Secretariat building. This 39-story tower was the first major international-style building in New York City. Because of its height, it can be seen from a great distance, which makes it the architectural emblem of the United Nations. So what is the international style? It originated in Europe in the 1910s and 1920s, as architects explored new materials and technologies, which allowed for more light and air. They were also concerned with an honest expression of structure and designs that were stripped of ornament. So it started as a notion by Adolf Loos, where he questioned the need for ornament at all. And that is picked up by architects like Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and Corbusier, and turned into a whole new style of architecture. But although the international style began in Europe, it actually got its name right here in New York City in 1932, with an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, which was curated by Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock. The international style is also known as modernism, and the two terms, for all practical purposes, are interchangeable when describing architecture. The reason why it's so appropriate for this international organization is that any other style of architecture would have had its roots in a national culture. It rejected historical references like Greek columns and Roman arches, and it started with a clean slate, which is in a sense what the UN was trying to do. And so because it looked out of place everywhere, it could sort of look at home anywhere. So this is what I love about this building. A big part of modern architecture was liberating the plane from its embedment in buildings. Spaces were typically made up of four walls and planes didn't stand free on their own. That is until Frank Lloyd Wright broke open the box with this free plan and open space. With these two solid stone bookends with glass stretching between them, the building almost reads as if it's two dimensional, which it wouldn't if it were all glass. So the fact that this tower is so narrow, almost like a thin wafer, allows all the spaces within to be filled with sunlight. You're never far from a window, which makes it a very pleasant place to be, especially compared to other office buildings at the time. This is really the first glass curtain wall in New York. And what that means is that the glass hangs off the structure like a curtain. Lieberhaus would be the first all glass curtain wall just a couple of years later. The downside of all this glass is that it allows solar heat gain inside the building which requires cooling to offset it. 
Corbusier originally wanted to add external shading devices sticking out to block the sun, but they ended up going with this thermopane glass. The other unique thing about this building is that they tried to incorporate the most modern HVAC systems of the day. And that is expressed with these horizontal vented bands at the mechanical levels about every 10 floors. Behind me, you can see the General Assembly building. So if the Secretariat is the recognizable face of the UN, by contrast, unless you've been here, many people don't even know what the General Assembly building looks like. And yet, this building is the literal home of global diplomacy. Once a year, delegates of the 193 member states gather here under one roof to discuss global issues. In a sense, this makes New York the capital of the world. So as the famous writer E.B. White said, and I'm paraphrasing here, New York is not a state capital, it's not a national capital, but because it's the home of the UN, it becomes the capital of the world. When you think about it, this is an incredible achievement. This modern idea that almost 200 nations get together and meet under one roof to discuss global issues. And because the United Nations was only founded in 1945, this has only been happening for less than 80 years. And the scale of the UN has continued to grow in that time where it started out with 51 member states, now it's grown to almost quadruple that size. So because it serves a very different purpose, the General Assembly building is very different from the Secretariat, which is essentially an office building. So Corbusier was also a painter, and the way he arranged these buildings is almost like a still life. The way the low-slung General Assembly building is juxtaposed against the slab of the Secretariat building. As far as the General Assembly is concerned, there are a few hints that Wallace Harrison was more involved in the design of this building. This saddle-shaped building with its concave curves is very reminiscent of another building that Harrison designed, the Hall Auditorium at Oberlin College. These curves actually create a sort of asymmetrical hourglass plan for the building. You can also see on the roof this large dome, which indicates where the General Assembly Hall is. That dome was not originally part of the design but was actually insisted upon by a U.S. senator to convince Congress to appropriate more funds for construction. He was concerned that Congress wouldn't appropriate the funds unless a dome was incorporated into the design. Every big governmental building in the U.S. had one, like the U.S. Capitol and many state capitals. And he was afraid that they couldn't conceive of a governmental building without a dome. So the costs associated with building this campus also led to some other changes to the original design. The Secretariat was originally designed to be 45 stories tall, but was cut down to 39. And the entire General Assembly building was intended to be made from the same marble as the side walls of the Secretariat. But because of the cost, they used Portland stone from England instead and only used marble for certain details. The inside of the General Assembly Hall was partially inspired by Alvar Aalto's finished pavilion from the 1939 World's Fair with these very tall canted walls of wood slats. And it's probably the most recognizable part of the building since it is so often shown on television when the General Assembly is in session. Another famous interior portion of the building is the South Lobby, where delegates enter the building, which is all glass. And the North Lobby is for press and other visitors with its alternating vertical bands of glass and marble. The inside of the North Lobby is an incredible space. And it's one place where you can clearly see Oscar Niemeyer's influence on the project. Nehemiah was known for graceful curves and also these very particular ramps, which were a signature of Corbusier, which influenced Nehemiah. And actually, the two had worked together previously on the Ministry of Education and Health Building in Brazil. Even though these buildings are relatively young, there's an incredible amount of history attached to them. If you'd like to hear more international architectural stories, let us know in the comments below.